You mm-hmm. know, when we have a premonition of something bad, we're gonna try and create a different reality that doesn't lead to that outcome. Welcome back. I'm here with Dr. Eric Wargo. How you doing, Eric? Good to see you again. Great. Good to see you. Okay. In your work on time loops and precognition, precognitive dreams, you've been delving into another area or perhaps the same area, but just expanding it outward with how to leverage precognitive insights to create you know, to come up with novel ideas and in some sense, novel ideas that didn't exist before that the creator didn't really even do the work. It's just almost as if they received it from on high, like an insight. Let's delve into that a little bit more. What have you learned at least in your, because you're working on a book right now, it's not out yet, but Right. I think by discussing it and talking about these ideas, it will make that book a reality, which is kind of part of what we're talking <laughs> oh, about. Yeah, <laughs> right. So the book I've just finished now, the working title is From Nowhere, and I can explain why I'm calling it that now. The publisher may decide that that's not the best title, but right. hopefully they'll keep it because I like that title. <clears throat> but this is really where I've been going with this research ever since I wrote time loops. It's honestly the book I wanted to write right after time loops, but too many people kept coming up to me at conferences and and sending me emails about dreams and wanting to know about dreams. So I thought, okay, I need to write a book that kind of distills this into the guide, you know, essentially about dream work. But what's really fascinating to me is precognition and its relation to creativity. Mm -hmm. Some of the most striking examples of precognition you know, in any ESP book, and even and in my book, Time Loops, for instance, are accounts, for instance, of writers who, you know, write a story that then comes true. And yeah, these are... not I, I have many examples of that personal examples, but... Well, there's plenty of public examples. You can go online and Google, you know, literary prophecy and things like that and come up with a lot of examples. But when you talk to writers, to uh, talk to actual writers or artists of any kind... They have these stories, these personal stories that it just happens again and again and again. And it's, I think, just as prevalent and just as important as precognitive dreaming. And if you're a creative person, it's probably even a better way of getting in touch with your precognitive nature is really scrutinizing, you know, not just your your finished works, but your like sort of aborted, started fragments that are living on some hard drive somewhere and that you're kind of embarrassed of maybe or just never went anywhere look at all that stuff because it it can be just mind-blowingly precognitive the same way some dreams can be but there are so many amazing examples of this my book time loops you know sort of starts with one of the most famous cases which is the book Futility. It was an 1898 mm-hmm. novel called Futility by Morgan Robertson who was a writer of sort of science fiction and sea adventure stories around the turn of the century. And he enjoyed, you know, some popularity in the first decade or so of of the last century. But he wrote this book called Futility about the biggest ocean liner ever called the Titan, which collides with an iceberg on April night in the North Atlantic on a run between New York and Liverpool. Okay. And almost all the passengers die because there's too few lifeboats okay well 14 years later on an april night in the north atlantic on a run between liverpool and new york the biggest ocean liner ever the titanic hits an iceberg and most people die because there's too few lifeboats well you know pretty uncanny and it's been debated widely by skeptics and paranormal researchers and so on and skeptics say, well, you know, in the universe of events, you know, there's always going to be some coincidences. Okay. Well, the problem is, the problem with that argument is, A, it happens all the time. There were like lots of other stories right around the same time that also predicted a big ocean liner disaster, but they didn't get the name of the ship right, you know, so we don't know about them. 
And countless people had dreams and premonitions of all kinds in the days and weeks leading up to the Titanic disaster. And just in the universe, in the larger universe of events, artworks and literary works and so on that seem to prophesy big news events, at least, are myriad. And for instance, 9-11 is a big example that I write about in my new book. There's just countless cases of artists, writers, filmmakers, visual well, didn't, artists, didn't musicians. Tom, didn't Tom Clancy have a plot point about something like that? A um, flying a plane into buildings? Well, I don't know. He may have, but the pilot episode of the Lone Gunman series, which was a spinoff of the X-Files, in March of 2001, their pilot episode was about a rogue element of the government remote controlling planes to fly into the the towers. But there were tons of other examples. And the example that is the most striking and most like just as astonishing, honestly, is a sculptor named Michael Richards. And this is not the comedian Michael Richards. This is a Jamaican American sculptor named Michael Rolando Richards. He was sort of an up and coming black sculptor in the late 1990s. And he had like sort of made a name for himself with these works that sort of were about the struggles of, of being a black artist in a white dominated art world. But they were all on themes of flight and crashing and planes crashing and people falling from the sky and so on. And he had one particularly striking sculpture called Tar Baby versus St. Sebastian. It's a sculptural self-portrait and he's like standing vertically erect, kind of like a building or whatever. And he's being pierced by all these airplanes. Okay. And he's in an aviator suit and he's being pierced by all these airplanes. Well, he died on 9-11 because his studio was on the 92nd floor of Tower One. Yikes. Yikes. Yeah. But there's just a million examples of this kind of thing. I mean, the thing is, it's so common that you can't just point to this as like, oh, well, in the larger universe, there's going to be coincidences like that. It's just not the case. I mean, he was doing art about this kind of traumatic destruction and death around planes and stuff for a couple of years leading up to that. And some of the works that he was working on in his studio that, that visitors had seen in his studio, of course, they're lost, were like one of them was his own torso with wings, like crashed to the ground. And one was of himself riding a burning meteor, you know, stuff like that. So very striking. But this is so common. And uh, there are so many great examples from writers. There are a lot of examples from science fiction writers, I think, because... Mm -hmm. We have an expectation that maybe science fiction writers often predict the future because it's kind of part of their job to do that. But writers like Phil Dick, he not only kind of foresaw a lot of technical and social developments in our society, which is, you can call it precognition if you want, but I, I tend to think of it just as kind of extrapolation from yeah, he was very current events. Yeah, he was very deliberate about that, but he was also precognizing things that are totally unpredictable. One example, I mean, there are many examples. Anthony Peak has a whole book of examples of his precognitive literary works, and I've added some in my book, Time Loops. I have a whole chapter on Phil Dick, and I've got more examples that I'm talking about in the book that I've just finished. But one example is that in 1960, he wrote kind of a short novel about these entrepreneurs building a robot, Abraham Lincoln. Okay. And couldn't find a publisher, so it just sat in his desk drawer. So no one read this novel. But then two years later, Disney unveiled its animatronic Abraham Lincoln. It's like it's still one of its most famous exhibits ever. And so Phil Dick thought, oh my God, you're out. he clipped the news story and said that, you know, here I'm a precog, it's like in my stories, you know, because I predicted this. But the most amazing thing is, are the details that he predicted. And he was living in the Bay Area when he wrote mm -hmm. this. And it sort of centers on the one of the entrepreneurs and his kind of obsession with this young woman that they've hired to kind of do work on the Lincoln robot. And one of her jobs, you know, is like she's staying up late at night. There's a scene where she stays up late applying makeup to the face of this robot Lincoln to bring verisimilitude to this android. Well, a decade and a half later, he finds himself living in Orange County, not too far from Disneyland. Okay. And he meets one of the women in his apartment building. And it's a young woman and, you know, 
he was probably attracted to her like he was attracted to every young woman <laughs> in his life. And she says, oh, yeah, I work at Disneyland. He said, oh, what do you do at Disneyland? Oh, I put makeup on the Abraham Lincoln, animatronic Abraham Lincoln late at night so that it looks real in the morning. You know, these kinds of just impossible. <laughs> are, you, are you unreal with Tim, Tim Powers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've read any of his books. So Tim Powers was good friends with them. I've interviewed, mm -hmm. I, I know Tim from my publisher and stuff like that. And yeah, Philip K. Dick was very deliberate about these things. He used to consult the I Ching mm -hmm. and it was so eerily predictive. There were times when it would provide him with an answer that he didn't like. So he would make it sleep outside. Like <laughs> <laughs> again, with the women thing, there are times that he was also not only attracted to young women, but crazy young women yeah there's a whole <laughs> yeah. anyway i didn't mean to i didn't mean to go off he was a hot mess <laughs> yeah. yeah and he would write his books he would consult the I Ching to write his books too for plot yeah. points and things like mm -hmm. that so who knows how he yeah. it's almost like a focusing or a tool of focus to help bring out the precognition well the great thing with phil dick is we not only have his books but we have his letters and in his letters to like his pen pal, Claudia Bush, he was very explicit about his dreams. And we have a record of his precognitive dreams right in his letters because he'd write a letter about a certain dream. And then we have evidence of how it played out in his life later. So I've got examples of this in time loops as well. He's a very rich source for the precognitologist because, you know, we have his fiction, but we've got letters, we've got like all written accounts by his various wives and, and people who knew him. And so there's a lot to go on with, with his work. So how else does it manifest? Does it work in, in science? Do people have scientific ideas that just kind of, or scientific theories that just kind of come out of nowhere? I, I would say yes with an asterisk because it's harder to study. It's very easy to study this stuff if you're dealing with something that's representational. So, for instance, with like inspired song lyrics or poem or novel or painting or sculptures like that, you can compare that thing then to something happening later in that person's life and say, oh, you know, the same way you can do precognitive dream work, you can compare a dream to an actual event or experience it's a little harder with scientific theories to do that kind of comparison thing and study how precognition may work i believe that yes my argument in this book is that inspiration is precognition that these two things are the same process but it's easier to study in some contexts than others so you get a lot of cases in the history of science of two people discovering the same thing at the same time who have never been in contact. And that like, it's not that surprising now because scientists are part of the same community and, and they're all competing and so on. So it's not that surprising when two people have the same discovery at the same time. But back in the day, like Darwin and Wallace, for instance, you know, they hit on, on the theory of natural selection or wrote about it in exactly the same year in the mid 1800s. Um, or Newton and Leibniz. or, or Leibniz, right, right. Right. There's so many examples like that. Well, how often might it be a case of one of them sort of precognizing the other person or them both precognizing each other? I, I suspect that this goes on a lot, but it's hard to prove. It's very hard to prove. But, well, not that you can prove anything in science, but it's hard to show compelling evidence that this is going on. But you can show very compelling evidence of other kinds of creativity, like in the arts where you have some product that's representational. Incidentally, the same difficulty occurs with non-representational arts, like music, pure music, and abstract art. It's very hard to like look at a work of art, look at a piece of music that doesn't have words, and say how this might have been precognitive of something that the artist was going to hear later or whatever. So there's a lot of ambiguity there. But when you're dealing like with song lyrics and things like that, you can really very easily find a lot of of evidence of this. So my book focuses mainly on artists, but there are a few scientists in there. One example of a precognitive scientist that we talked about in our earlier interview is Sigmund Freud. Mm -hmm. His book, The Interpretation of Dreams, really, it was a theory that really came to him as a product of this one dream that he had in 1895 about these symptoms in the mouth of this patient of his. And 
he built this whole dream theory around it. But in fact, that dream turned out to be a premonition of oral cancer that he developed almost three decades later in his life. So right there is an example of kind of precognitive inspiration. And one key fact in the sort of time looping nature of precognition is that we never have a clear and accurate understanding of a precognitive experience. And there are really interesting reasons, I think, why that's the case, having to do with living in a self-consistent universe that is not paradoxical. I mean, I think that, you know, when we have a premonition of something bad, we're going to try and create a different reality that doesn't lead to that outcome. And but so it'll lead there anyway, by, but it'll lead there. That. It'll lead there anyway, if it's distorted and then we don't understand it. And I think this actually makes a better interpretation or better way of understanding things like symbolism in dreams and artwork. Freud thought, that our dreams were the disguised fulfillment of repressed wishes. Well, I think that, no, they're the kind of oblique representation of future learning experiences and future thoughts and future wishes sometimes. But they're oblique and distorted and symbolic because they can't be literal or we wouldn't have that future that led to that dream. So the only way it sort of shakes out in in our brains is these kind of oblique and symbolic dreams and impressions of future events. But that's an example of a scientist whose precognition was intrinsic to their creativity. Now, with the creativity that some authors have, what are some other examples? Because the other difficulty with looking at authors is sometimes on the edits, as you kind of mentioned earlier, the first idea tends to be the purest when it comes to yeah. precognitive content, but mm-hmm. as they edit and they try to make it more realistic or more verisimilitude, whatever you want to call it, they're going to edit some of these things out. So what other examples do you have of things that were kind of not perfect, but when they wrote it, at least had core elements of a future event that happened? Let's see. The I'm just trying to run through the chapters of the book in my head. I think let's deviate from writers and let's talk about a filmmaker um, oh, that's, yeah that's fine totally yeah fine. so andre tarkovsky the russian filmmaker is sort of famous for having i mean he was like all into paranormal phenomena and esp mm-hmm. and stuff like that and he planned to make a film of carlos castaneda's books and stuff like that before he died but his film stalker which came out i think in 1979 or 1980 it's a masterpiece of science fiction film, which is about this kind of zone that's been created by some disaster. So it's sort of vague what caused it. It's based on a novel about a UFO landing that created this this strange zone where all these UFO artifacts are left behind. But in the movie, he wanted to make it uh, a little bit more vague and abstract, but there's hints that it was a nuclear explosion that created this zone and that's sort of magical, has magical properties. And at the heart of the zone is this room where your deepest wish will be granted. And so the stalker leads this writer and the scientist sort of through this zone to get to this room. So l- lots of people are aware that that sort of prophesied the Chernobyl disaster six years later. In fact, there is the Chernobyl was caused by an explosion in the fourth energy block of the nuclear reactor. And there's a line in the film about a breakdown in the fourth bunker as the cause of the zone. Okay. And so, you know, very striking. And what became of what's called the zone of alienation around the Chernobyl site it was g- guarded by you know armed guards same as the zone in, in stalker and it sort of is this wild overgrown place you know with like kind of dilapidated buildings that they're overgrown with you know, stuff it's just uncanny how this film predicted chernobyl and the aftermath of chernobyl but what people don't know or they haven't quite put together <laughs> is that there's a sort of centerpiece of the story where the stalker sort of tells a story he doesn't want to go into the room the wish fulfilling room and he he explains why he tells the story of this previous stalker that had gone into the room to bring his dead brother back to life okay and because he he had led his brother to his death in the zone and so he, he went into the room to bring his dead brother back to life and he came out but instead of his brother coming back to life he found himself a rich man 
and then he hung himself because his truest wish had not been to bring his brother back to life, but to become rich. And he couldn't live with that. So he, he kills himself. Okay. So the stalker in the film doesn't even want to go into the room because his deepest wish might, might not be what he thinks it is. Now they filmed stalker in this very polluted environment in Estonia. It was downstream from a chemical factory and there was like chemicals in the water and people got all kinds of skin reactions and stuff. And they had to go back and refilm it because the the film stock that they used on the first time was improperly processed by a film lab in Moscow. But he was kind of like Ahab, you know, Tarkovsky was. He just had to like fulfill right. his vision. So he, you know, took everyone back and they refilmed in this toxic environment, whatever. So two years later, his star actor, who plays the writer, died of an incurable lung cancer. And he was only like 52, I think, or even younger, maybe. 42, maybe, and like very young, died very young of this incurable lung cancer, very baffling. And then a few years after that, while he's finishing up what became his last film, The Sacrifice, Tarkovsky was diagnosed with an incurable lung cancer. And he, unfortunately, he doesn't leave us a, a record of his thoughts in his last year. I mean, he was too depressed and, and so forth as he was dying. But the point is, it would have been probably apparent to him that he had led his friend to his death in the zone to film to fulfill his artistic vision and had caused both their deaths and in fact after he died his wife larissa also died of lung cancer so this is like really uncanny series of events which is represented in the film and the story in the form of that parable about the, the stalker i mean it's just wild stuff like that and when you drill down into like there are a lot of examples you know you can go online and find examples of artworks that prophesy some big event like 9 11 or whatever mm -hmm. but the amazing thing is is when you know something about the artist's biography and you can really really look closely at how their works play out in their lives afterwards not in terms of big historical events but in terms of just events in their own lives it becomes very striking that, that this is what's going on that you know inspiration is often if not always and i suggest it probably as always a matter of sort of responding to events and learning experiences and upheavals and traumas lying ahead all right now all right, this is a weird question and what about things in the external environment that either aid or manifest Precognitions. I don't know if you talked about it or one of your co-hosts talked about it. There's something about seeing repeating patterns of numbers and, and, and things like that. Like you'll look at your license plate in front of you and then you look at your dashboard and mm -hmm. it has 1111. Yeah. Or a raven just kind of lands on your perch and just starts squawking at you. Mm -hmm. And you have like a book of Edgar Allan Poe on your desk. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That happened to me, by the way, like that exact <laughs> thing. But okay. these sort of things where you recognize synchronicities at particular moments in time, mm -hmm. but it's, it's your external environment, sort of, right? How, how well, that's that that's that's this? the key. That's the key. How much of it is the external environment and how much of it is your noticing? Remembering, right. You're remembering, noticing, paying attention. It's your attention that's a huge factor in this. And mm -hmm. this is where the debate over synchronicity versus precognition comes in. And I get into this argument a lot, a lot with yeah, no, no, let's because, really, uh, it'd be curious yeah, here with the arguments, yeah. right? Well, okay, so let's talk about the classic case of synchronicity, which is the beetle episode in Carl Jung's book, Synchronicity, scarab, sort of right. the scarab beetle. So, okay, so what, what's happening is in his narrative, and it's a very short sort of snippet, but it's probably the most famous thing he ever wrote. He's treating this young woman who's very kind of closed off, very rationalistic, hyper-rationalistic, and she's sort of closed off to the kind of mystical dimension of life. Her therapy isn't really going anywhere, and he's kind of bored, whatever. But she brings into her therapist one morning a dream she'd had the night before that someone gave her this precious gold jewelry in the form of a golden scarab beetle, of an Egyptian scarab. And right as she's telling him this, he hears a, a scratch on his window, and he turns around and it's, it's a rose chafer beetle. It's sort of the closest relative to a scarab beetle in Switzerland. And he opens the door, you know, cups it in his hand and hands it to her, sort of like a shaman and said, here's your scarab. And so 
Jung writes about this as this synchronistic moment of this kind of alignment of objective reality, delivering this scarab beetle right at the moment that his patient is telling him her dream about a scarab beetle. And it's like, this is somehow transcendent of mental causation. This is somehow the psyche interacting with physical reality. Mm-hmm. Well, from his point of view, as the doctor sort of between these two beetles, essentially, Sure, it might look like that, but he's completely ignoring the fact that this was simply a precognitive dream on the part of his patient, that he had a role in fulfilling his patient. And we now actually know a lot about this patient. And just 10 years ago, uh, an article was published by the curator of the Jung Archive in Zurich, which gave all kinds of information on this patient that was never known before. Her name was Maggie Quarles Van Uppert, and she was a Dutch aristocrat, a young Dutch aristocrat. But what we now know is that she was having precognitive dreams all the time in her in her therapy. And they weren't always archetypal like this. They didn't have our archetypal meaning. But anyway, this was simply a, a standard precognitive dream. I mean, it's just kind of dream like mm-hmm. lots of people have dreams about things happening in their therapy sessions the next day. This is a common, common theme. And clinicians who are open to this will write about it. Most clinicians aren't open to it, but in, in the Jungian tradition, they'll talk about synchronicity. And so you'll have lots of examples of this kind of thing that gets framed as synchronicity. So what happened is she has this dream about someone handing her a beetle, and the dream, of course, transforms it into a precious golden Egyptian scarab beetle. Because, of course, right after he hands it to her, he gives her this kind of inspiring speech about the role of the scarab in Egyptian religion. So it's capturing that bit of symbolism there in her dream. And it's precious and golden because this was a hugely important moment in her life. So the dream was, this is what dreams do. They'll take sort of a future event or future experience. They'll sort of symbolically embellish it with associations. So she's simply having a precognitive dream about this event. Now, what's funny about it, but this is actually true of any precognitive dream, is there's a time looping dimension of it he would not have reached and gotten that scarab had had she not been telling him her dream. So the dream caused the event too. There's that causal part of it. Mm -hmm. The dream led to its own fulfillment. And that's where it looks like somehow physical events are being manifested by the psychic, but there's a causal loopiness there that gives that appearance. Most synchronistic experiences can be explained in that precognitive time loop way. And I I have not seen enough compelling cases where it, it seems like objective events are, are somehow behaving intelligently. Jung thought they did. Jung thought that that's how it worked. But I'm highly skeptical of that. I, I think that when you drill down and sort of deconstruct these synchronistic episodes, they're time loops. They're exactly what I'm talking about is time loops. Okay, so going back to the creative aspect of this, do many of these artists know that they're doing this, or is it kind of long after the fact? It's after the fact, for the most part. And in most cases, they're never aware. The concept of precognition is so new. I mean, it's not that new, really, but for most people, most people have never heard of it. It's so counterintuitive that even if they've heard of it, the last thing people will ever do is apply it to their own experience. So... Uh, Again, they may grasp at a concept like synchronicity to help them understand these experiences, but for the most part, no, artists are not aware of this happening any more than dreamers are aware of this happening. But I think more and more artists are aware of it. And like I talk to a lot of kind of younger artists who like, yeah, this is happening all the time in my work. And I like to think that we're moving into a kind of a new era where people are a little more aware of what precognition is and how it may be playing out in their lives. And certainly that's what I want to try to foster with this book, which is called From Nowhere. I'll explain why I'm calling it that, by the way. One of the... Ex Nilo, something like that? Ex Nilo, well, okay, we can get to that idea of creation ex Nilo because that is the implication of this. One of the things that comes through again and again and again when artists or scientists talk about their inspired moments is that ideas just come. They don't feel like they have any ownership of this idea. It just came to them somehow. You see some version of that story again and again and again in writers' biographies and memoirs. But the thing is, the experience of psychics is the same. 
when psychics describe how information comes to them, whether it be in, you know, whether, however they're interpreting it, whether they interpret it as remote viewing or precognition or telepathy or whatever, that it's that same experience of from nowhere. Like it's like, it's coming from outside. It feels like it's coming from outside. To me, this is an important datum. This is an important piece of information here. If psychic information completely maps on to the experience of receiving inspiration, then what is that hinting at? What is that hinting at? And in the argument that my book tries to make, there's no way to prove this, but I give a lot of compelling examples that inspiration has a precognitive component to it. Okay. So how can artists use this to their advantage? Well, that's a great question. And I'm tempted to say, just keep doing what they're doing, you know, Mm -hmm. embrace inspiration. And I think that artists, if they're good artists, they know that already, that they know that intuitively. It's not necessary for an artist to understand where their ideas are coming from. It's I don't think it's necessary for them to understand that. Mm -hmm. I think it's more interesting from a theoretical point of view is more interesting from a psychological point of view. We want to try to understand human nature and understand well, what is the real origin of ideas. I think that's where the interest of this comes. And certainly I think it can be inspiring for artists to think, oh, wow, I'm like being precognitive in my work, but I don't think it's necessary to understand that. I mean, the, all the great art in history has been made without people necessarily understanding that they were literally prophetic in what they were doing. So I don't think it's essential to know what you're doing or know how it's working, you know, any more than for a a dreamer, they don't need to know the mechanism. A dreamer can get ideas from dreams, whether or not they believe that they're precognitive or whether they're, you know, believe anything else. They can believe whatever they want to about dreams and that that won't make their dreams any less powerful. So I really don't think it's, it's, it's essential for artists to understand this, but I think it's an argument for why artists should be taken a lot more seriously than than they often are in our world that's dominated by technology and science. Has this ever gotten anybody into trouble? I can think of one example, by the way, but I'll I'll reserve that for... Has what ever gotten anybody into trouble? Precognitive creativity. Meaning, what do you mean by getting into trouble? I'll, I'll give you an example. So back in like the late 30s, and I don't know where I read this, but There's a magazine called Analog Science Fiction and Fact, and they had published a story that was effectively about the development of an atomic bomb. And Analog got a letter or was contacted by the government or the the editor or whatever, and the government was very nervous for obvious reasons because the Manhattan Project was this massive classified project, and they thought there was a, a leak. But it was just some guy who yeah. extrapolated the future based on, you know, I don't know if it was based on kind of what technological knowledge was available or if he just happened to stumble onto the wrong story. Yeah, I know that story. And I don't, I'm not aware of people getting in trouble in quite that way. But the possibility is, is always there, certainly. And In fact, intelligence organizations have become interested in this. A German intelligence or military organization even started a program at one of their universities sort of working with literary scholars at a German university to try and divine sort of black swan events using literature and using writers and sort of literary scenes around the world to see what could be divined from what writers were doing in different countries of the world. And so this is something that has been taken seriously, definitely, at least by the German intelligence service. And I would imagine that it's probably being taken seriously by other intelligence agencies as well. But I don't know of any cases like that. I know that case you're talking about. Um, Mm -hmm. I forget the name of the writer, but yeah, I don't know any other cases like that. Okay. Yeah. So just writers be forewarned that (laughs) sometimes you might write something that's a little too close to the right to the nose. All right. What advice would you give to writers and 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 to some extent you've already done this but what advice would you give to writers to better make use of this ability or to cultivate it i think my advice to writers is just do what writers are supposed to do and just do more of it and that is to say really 
really listen to your inspiration, really listen to the sort of non-rational side of you and really listen to those things that don't make sense. Those mm -hmm. things that just, that really don't, you don't feel like you have ownership of and that don't make sense. And actually maybe one piece of advice, and I, I can't guarantee that this is going to produce better art, but it is true that precognition comes through most clearly when it hasn't been edited. And like, so one of the chapters in my book is on Virginia Woolf, who was guided by visions and experiences, which I believe were precognitive. And I think believe there's evidence of this, but she's a really hard person to study because she edited and re-edited and rewrote and rewrote and rewrote. And like, so the initial images in her drafts yeah, the would, would of, get, you know. would get sort of polished over through all this kind of yeah, polishing essentially. But fortunately, there's such a huge industry of Virginia Woolf studies that we actually have the first draft of, of like mm -hmm. of her novels and things like that that we can look at and look for evidence. So you can study her process really well. And she was precognizing events in her life and so on in her writing. But again, I wouldn't say that it's advice not to edit. Everything kind of comes out in a kind of raw form and you have to edit it and so on. But just but beware that where the precognition, the real prophetic stuff is going to be is in that kind of raw, unedited, spontaneous, kind of first drafty stuff. And the more work, the more reshaping and reworking you do, the less it's going to be clear or, or obvious. What was the most surprising thing that you learned during the course of writing this book? One of the most surprising things, and I'll say that the book is actually going to be two books because it, it turned out to be huge and I split it up into two halves. And one of them is going to be more on kind of applying this idea of literary criticism. But so this is coming more from the, the second of these books. But literary biographers and critics are as fearful of the paranormal and of anything smacking of the paranormal as scientists are. The kind of refusals that we're used to getting from scientific skeptics are just as operative in the humanities. And that's one of the things that was very, very striking to me. Oh, and yeah. Yeah, get, yeah. Like science fiction or fantasy are considered like the gutter by well, they're, they're considered literature. the gutter, but also but right. but even more the experiences of writers like big writers like I've got examples from, you know, the biggest literary figures, Kafka, Mary Shelley, Tolkien, again, again and again, again, you, but you get biographers who just will not go there in considering kind of the coincidences, you know, between mm -hmm. their art and their lives and just will not do that. And when artists themselves or writers themselves will point to these strange experiences in their lives or their mystical experiences or whatever, paranormal experiences of one form or another, biographers just do not want to deal with that. And it's very, very striking that the same kind of stigma that you get around this stuff in sort of the, the mainstream scientific world, we think of the, the sciences as being this, this kind of stigmatized, they, they just stigmatize the paranormal, you know, to death, you know, skeptics, we think of as, as kind of scientists or science minded people, but the same kind of stigma operates in the humanities as well with biographers and literary critics and so on. So that was one of the things, the big surprising things that came through in the research I've done for this. How did it manifest itself? Like, could you give an example of something where a literary critic should have mentioned something, but they just like at every turn, they just went out of their way to just. Yeah. Well, like Kafka, Kafka's life was like totally weird. I mean, he was having, same normal experiences. I'm, I'm, I'm all in on this one. Yeah, no, he was having paranormal experiences from the get go and dissociative experiences, out of body experiences, ghost encounters. And his life is just full of synchronicity. I mean, it's just like reading about Phil Dick. I mean, his, his life is just as rich paranormally as someone, you know, that we would associate with literary gutters like Phil Dick, argued to be the greatest writer ever, you know, and he is just like those guys. But biographers ignore the coincidences, ignore the stuff. You know, there are many biographies that have been written of Kafka that just ignore all this stuff. One of his big biographers, Alt is his last name, sort of will go there a little bit and talk about kind of coincidences between his art and his life. But he'll do it in kind of a safe terms, like the artist kind of fulfilling their own myth. This is the kind of argument you'll get from 
skeptics that well artists sort of have a unconscious template for how their life is going to turn out and so they're they're just living that out and that's why you get events in their works that resemble something happening in their life later but when you have an open mind <laughs> and you think what if inspiration really is precognition and it totally the transforms the right. evidence floods in yeah but you again you have to bring the kind of biographical focus to it because kafka was not precognizing public events in his life. And I, I will hasten to add, I'm not arguing that he was somehow predicting the Holocaust and stuff like that. That's been argued before, that he was kind of a prophet of, of the gulags and the Holocaust and all that. And that is not ex at all what I'm arguing. I'm arguing that he was precognizing mm -hmm. very personal things happening in his own life. Right. But yeah, you need to bring that biographical focus and link their works and their lives in a very kind I of fine-grained way. In other words, you can't just take either their works in isolation or their biographies right. in isolation you kind right. of have to look at both you have to look at both yeah when does this book come out i don't know i'm just now looking for a publisher so i'm hoping it'll come out some point in 2024 is my hope that's fast man well i don't know it usually is a publisher's you know, about a year glacial pace right well yeah. they do but i'm hoping to find a publisher by the end of this year so that hopefully it'll see the light of day by the end of next year that's my hope i don't know all right. Well, good luck with it. I think it's going to be a fascinating book. And I think your research is fascinating. And I'm kind of getting sucked into this whole time loop stuff and, you know, just trying to learn more about it because I think I'm open to it. I don't know what it means or what it implies for the human species, but there's definitely more than what we see. And there's definitely evidence of all these sorts of things in the world that traditional materialist science ignores it. And I don't know if it's, it's, it's that they're afraid of it or if it's that people can't imagine a world where it's more open, right? Imagine the disruption that, again, we're not talking about telepathy or anything like that, but we're, we're, we're talking about precognition. Imagine if people were able to cultivate that talent mm -hmm. and then suddenly everybody's predicting everything, right? There would be an adjustment to society and it would be, it would be very disruptive right for a while but i think ultimately good for the human species so anyway thank you for doing your work and i appreciate you and i can't wait to see the book thank you it's been a pleasure talking about it absolutely if you enjoyed this video please click on like subscribe and the notification button so that you're alerted anytime i post something new